Hello, Coach Burroughs here as we travel the basketball coaches road. The 33rd Olympiad just concluded here, August 2024, as we record this episode. The men's and women's Olympic basketball teams won gold. Women, their eighth consecutive, nine overall. The men won their 17th gold medal. This episode is about men's basketball gold number one. That was the 11th Olympiad. 1936 in Berlin, famous for the historic Jesse Owens performance, four gold medals as an in-your-face to the Aryan race Nazi rubbish. But we passionate basketball enthusiasts also know 1936, the first year basketball, is an Olympic medal sport. I want you to meet the head coach and the assistant coach of the team. That chain of command remains in some debate almost 90 years later. While the Olympic story itself is entertaining, 5-0 gold medal ending, how the team and the coaches were chosen and operated together is what this episode will focus on. The current system to choose players is a 15-member USA Basketball Board of Directors basically selects players with their main source being the NBA or the WNBA. Decent pool of talent there. In 1936, the 11th Olympic Games was August 1st through the 16th. There was not a committee selecting players. It was an Olympic trials tournament held four months earlier, April, Madison Square Garden. There was no budget. Teams had to pay their own way to New York. Eight teams vying for the Olympic bid. Breakdown. There were five college teams. One YMCA team, I thought there'd be more from the Y since that's where it was born and from which it spread. And there were two AAU teams. These two were the powerhouses of USA basketball of the era. The McPherson Globe Refiners from small town central Kansas and Universal Pictures from Tinseltown, Hollywood. The two teams meet in the finals. Universal beating McPherson 44-43, earning the automatic trip to the Olympics to represent the USA. By that measure, the head coach of Universal is James Jimmy Needles. He'll be the head coach at the first Olympics the basketball team has ever played in. The head coach of the McPherson Refiners is Gene Johnson. He lost in the finals. He will be the assistant coach. I said earlier, Universal represents the USA. But the rule was the winning team gets half the roster. The Olympic roster limit was 14. Seven Universal players go. The other half of the remaining roster, McPherson sends six players, and then there's one what we'll call a free agent from the Washington Huskies college team. This is a picture of the team. They're on their way to Berlin on the SS Manhattan. On one end is Needles, and on the other end, this is Coach Johnson. Is this photographer arrangement creativity or a microcosm of icy Olympic coaching relationship? James Naismith is on that ship too. He will be honored at the Games. In the regular season, the two AAU powers had played four times. McPherson won all of them, including the AAU championship game, which had been played two weeks prior to the Olympic trial tournament. Gene Johnson is McPherson head coach. He's a visionary figure. He's a native of, he lives his entire life in Kansas. He is a regional icon there, mainly because of the tactic he pioneered, which is called the full court zone press defense. All of us coaches may not know his name, but we have borrowed from Coach Johnson. James Needles goes by Jimmy, highly regarded in his region. He's on the West Coast. He will be the head coach of Loyola Marymount and later the University of San Francisco. One of his star players was Pete Newell. Newell goes on to win national championships at California, and he is the Olympic head coach of the 1960 gold medal team with Oscar and West as captains. Newell's biographer writes, Newell played basketball under Coach Needles, who would be the most important influence in his coaching career. 
Needles innovated help side defense, which means all of us coaches have borrowed from Needles too. It's clear both coaches have big time credentials. Now, in the 1936 Olympics, 14 players. But there's a restriction imposed in Berlin, mandating no more than seven players on a game roster in the book per game. I think the USA uses it to their advantage. We all know there's no way to get 14 players in a game. They're playing two 20-minute halves. So what the coaches do is they split their 14 into two squads and they alternate games. The seven universals, having won the automatic bid, would play the first game. The six McPhersons and Washington Husky player would play the next, etc., etc. The USA officially was 5-0, and but the first game, a forfeit. In the four games they played an opponent, they won easily by double digits, outscoring opponents totally 162-59. to I checked the box scores of the games and the official book. It goes down this way. Game one, five Universal players, two McPherson. Game two, four McPherson starters, two Universal, the college player. Game three, six Universal and the Washington Husky player. Game four, which happens to be the gold medal game, Four McPherson, two Universal, and the Washington Husky. It seems as close to equal agreement playing time as you can get. But playing time, that's the eternal basketball issue. 60 years later, when interviewed, a Universal player was still boiling mad about not playing in that gold medal game. Quote, we earned our way up there. We earned our way to the top. Meaning, Universal won the right to be there. And it should have been universal in the gold medal game. But that was not the agreement. And remember, in that year, the two teams had played five times along the way with McPherson going four and one. Probably a factor is McPherson, along with their press, had the best player in the country. Six foot eight inch Joe Fortenberry. He can dunk. And in the 30s, that's extraordinary. They didn't even know what to call it. Sports writer said he was putting the ball in the basket like dunking a donut into his coffee. And that's how the dunk term comes about. He was the team's leading scorer, averaging 14 points in the two games he was in, games two and four. There is no record that I could find anyway of how the coaches split the time at the Olympics. The basketball rosters say Jimmy Needles, head coach, and his universal players won games one and three. Do you think that Needles, just wanting to win gold, set aside the territorialism of his head coach title, considered the logical coaching move was to tell Coach Gene Johnson to be head coach for games two and four because Johnson knew his McPherson players, and they were up. It was their turn to play. It happened they would also be in the gold medal game. In 1986, Johnson was interviewed by his local newspaper, the Wichita Eagle. He said, while the records say that Needles was the head coach, Johnson said he was. The loss at Madison Square Garden was the result of an agreement to try not to embarrass an American ally at the Olympic trials. We didn't use the zone press on purpose, said Johnson. Jimmy, that's Coach Needles, came to me and said, Gene, don't beat us by 15 or 20 points like you always do. I was to be the Olympic coach anyway, and both teams were going to the Olympics, so we agreed to take it easy on them. The historical record says the Olympic trials were the determinant. He goes on, we had a private agreement that I would coach the team, said Johnson. You see who played in the final game, don't you? Four of my players, one of theirs, and one sub from the University of Washington. But his team was supposed to play game four by the equal time agreement. Actually, two universal players were in the gold medal game, which the USA won 19 to eight. The low score, because it rained. Actually, it stormed. You can see the umbrellas in the stands. The game was played in mud, slop, puddles of an outdoor clay court tennis stadium that had been converted. The German Olympic Committee, apparently unaware that basketball 
is an indoor hardwood game or if outdoors, weather permitting, like baseball. Coach Johnson had a winning percentage of 755 at Wichita University, which is now Wichita State. That was ranked third among all Shocker basketball coaches at the time of his induction into the Wichita State Hall of Fame. He died in 1989 at age 87, three years after that Eagle article. Coach Needles did not leave a book or an interview that I could find where he talks about the Olympics. Most of my information comes from Pete Newell's book. Coach Needles died in 1969 at age 69. He's a Hall of Fame member of both the University of San Francisco and Loyola Marymount. Both plaques list him head coach, 1936 Olympic team. I'm not judging here. I admire both coaches, and I'm here only to travel with other coaches on this competitive, emotional, and oftentimes complicated coach's road. What is agreed is that James Naismith was in Berlin, and he watched the 1936 Olympic basketball games. He was honored as game's inventor by tossing the opening tip for all of Olympic basketball. That means he extends all the way to the 17th gold medal the USA men just recently won. And this is agreed on. He helped award the gold medals to all 14 members of the first USA gold medal basketball team. Coaches do not get Olympic medals. But clearly, Needles and Johnson had done Naismith and their country proud. Next post coming soon. Please subscribe. It's free for you. It helps me. Any ideas you have, just leave a comment or my Gmail is on the title page and in the credits. This is The Coach's Road, where basketball coaches travel, along with passionate hoop enthusiasts. Coach Burroughs, over and out.